Hi there, my name is Dylan and welcome to the seventh lesson where we'll investigate what effect a change of gradient has on the graph of a linear function. By the end of this lesson you should be able to describe what effect a change in the gradient has on the graph of a linear function. To start, we're going to refer back to some examples from lesson one. When you go to a game park, the total entrance fee is an amount per person plus a flat rate for the vehicle. The number of people multiplied by the cost per person plus the rate for the vehicle gives us the total entrance fee. This is an example of a linear function, as is this next example. If you rent a vehicle, the rental company might charge an amount per kilometer traveled plus a constant rental fee. The number of kilometers traveled is multiplied by the cost per kilometer and then the rental fee is added to give us the grand total. Now let's see if we can write this down as a formula. We know that the total count is going to be given by t of x and that x is the number of kilometers traveled. So therefore t of x, the total amount, is equal to m multiplied by x plus c where m is the cost per kilometer and c is the rental fee. If the rental fee is 20 rand and the cost per kilometer is 5 rand, what does this mean in the formula? Remember the fee is constant, it does not change. The cost per kilometer is multiplied by x, or the number of kilometers. So t of x is equal to 5x plus the constant fee of 20. Let's draw the graph of t. I hope that this is now easy for you. We know that c is 20, so we know that the graph cuts the y-axis at 20. What should I do now? Okay, so now for every one unit of change in the input values, the output value will change by five units. But the scale I'm using makes it difficult for me to measure one unit accurately. Let's find a ratio that works nicely with the scale we've got on our graph. Here on the x-axis, I used a scale where one block represents five units. Now for every one unit I move to the right, I must move five units up. So for every five units I move to the right, how many units must I move up? I must use the same ratio and also multiply the y change by five. Okay, so now I know I need to move 25 units up. So I first move five units to the right in the x direction then I'm going to move 25 units up, which will land me up here at 45. So that is my second point. Now because I know this is a linear function, I know that I need to join these two points with a straight line. So I'm going to do that now. And I know that this is a graph of the function t, so I can label this as t. So after traveling 5 kilometers, the total account is 45 rand. Let's do a simple check. Remember, we know that t of x is equal to 5x plus 20. So when the input value is 5, my calculations go as follows. 5 times 5, which is 25, plus 20, which is 45. So on the graph, where we use the rate of change to find this point here, when x is equal to 5, y is equal to 45, we know that our calculations were correct. 
What if the car rental company increased their rental fee to a more realistic amount, say to 500 Rand? In other words, they increased it by 480 Rand. How would that change our graph? Well, every point on our graph would need to move up 480 units. Remember, this is the type of change we looked at in the previous lesson. When a graph is shifted or moved up and down, we say that it has been translated. Now, what else in our example could the car rental company change? Well, they could change the cost per kilometer. Let's say that they still charge a car rental fee of 20 Rand, but in order to attract more customers, they're going to charge a rate per kilometer of 3 Rand. Now, what value in our formula is going to change? It is the rate of change, or M, that will change in our formula. Now, let's call this new function N. Therefore, we know that N of X is equal to 3X plus 20. Now, the constant here is the Y-intercept. So the graph of N is going to cut the Y-axis over here at the point 0, 20. For the graph of t, we have a point where x is equal to 5. So I'm going to find n of 5 so that we can compare the graphs and their output values. When x is equal to 5, we have that n of 5 is equal to 3 times 5 plus 20. So therefore, n of 5 is equal to 15 plus 20. In other words, n of 5 is equal to 35. So let's plot that point. When the x value is 5, the output value is 35. So that is the point there. Now I can draw the graph of n by simply joining those two points. So there we have the graph of the function n. Did you notice what is different between the graphs? The graph of t has been turned to become the graph of n. We call this a rotation. The graph of t has rotated or turned about the point y equal to 20 to become the graph of n. Have a look at the graphs again. Here, the rate of change has changed. In t, the rate of change was 5. It's now changed to 3. And as such, the graph of t has turned to become the graph of n. We need to understand what effect the rate of change has on the output values. For the graph of t, the rate of change is 5. So when the x or input values change by 5 units, in other words, from 0 to 5, the output changes from 20 to 45, in other words, a total change of 25 units. For the graph of n, where the rate of change is 3, when the input values change by the same amount, in other words, from 0 to 5, the output values change from 20 to 35, which is an overall change of 15 units. When the gradient is a bigger number, the difference in the y values is greater, and the graph is steeper. For t, the rate of change is 5. For graph n, the rate of change is 3. t is steeper than n. We can also say that the graph of n is flatter or shallower than the graph of t. Now there is something else that I want to show you. In lesson 5, I drew this graph. It is the graph of y equal to minus 3 divided by 2x plus 1. But I've also drawn this graph here in red, which has the formula y equal to 2 divided by 3x plus 1. Now I want you to look at the values of the gradients. Here the gradient is minus 3 divided by 2, and here the gradient is 2 divided by 3. What do you notice? 
the one number is positive and the other number is negative. And these numbers are also multiplicative inverses. Now what happens when we multiply multiplicative inverses? Well, let's see what happens when we multiply them. Negative 3 divided by 2, multiplied by 2, divided by 3. Well, we can divide this 3 into that 3, and we can divide this 2 into that 2, so our final answer will be equal to negative 1. But what is so special about that? Let's take a look. Here I have a set square where this angle is 90 degrees. Now look, can you see that the angle between the two lines is 90 degrees? So to get from the black line to the red line, I need to rotate through 90 degrees. Now notice that this is not a translation. The graph hasn't been shifted. This is just one example. You could check it out for any other line graphs that are perpendicular. In general, we say that if two lines are perpendicular, then the product of their gradients is equal to minus 1. So if I have two straight line functions, f and g, and if I know that f is perpendicular to g, then I know that the gradient of the one function, in this case f, m1, if multiplied by the gradient of g, in other words, m2, I know that that product will equal negative 1. What is the gradient if we turn a line flat like this? Well, the gradient is 0 because there is no increase or decrease. But what does the formula look like? If the gradient is 0, y equal to mx plus c becomes y equal to 0x plus c, or just simply y equal to c. Let's draw a flat graph and see if y is always equal to c. So I'm going to draw just such a flat line. Now here, y is equal to 1. At this point, y is still equal to 1. Even at this point, y is equal to 1. So for a horizontal or flat line, the gradient is 0, and the general form of the equation is simply y equal to c. So here we have that y is equal to 1. Now what is the gradient of a vertical line like this? Well, let me draw a vertical line. Now notice that this line does not cut the y-axis. So we know that there won't be any c in the formula. But look, y can be any number. Here, y is equal to 1. Here, y is equal to minus 2. And here, y is equal to 3. So the only way we can describe a vertical line like this is using the x values. On this line, x is always minus 3. So we can write that x is equal to minus 3. And in general, the formula for a vertical line is simply given as x equal to k, or a constant. The gradient of the vertical line is undefined. Do join me in the eighth lesson where we'll wrap up linear functions by looking at some interesting applications.